Hope that you all had a great week so far. It's been very warm and AC does not seem to help too much. It's getting a little bit cooler. Hang in there. We'll get through this. We want to pray for a few things at the end, but for now, we want to look at God's words, our ongoing study on Wednesday evenings in the book of Philippians. Let us look at chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 tonight. Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. Just two verses tonight. There is a philosophy in the world and even in the church that says, if my desires are not being met, I will never be satisfied. Maybe you can identify with this. If my dissatisfaction, if my needs or desires are not being met, I will never be satisfied. So we come into the church thinking that the church has to meet my satisfaction. This kind of need mentality leads to a man-centered salvation. So we have false notion of what satisfaction is, why we are in church. The satisfaction of my need is the goal of my salvation, people say. It isn't. In fact, it is just the opposite, diametrically opposed to what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that the church exists or that God exists so that your needs can be met and therefore you be satisfied. The goal of your life and the goal of my life is not to make sure I'm satisfied, but rather God is satisfied. There's a big, big difference. The goal of my life, in fact, is to be like Christ. If you want to water down or simplify your Christian walk, my walk, my focus, my purpose, my existence is to become like Christ. It makes it a lot simple. My goal, your goal, is to become like Christ. That's what the Word of God teaches in Romans chapter 8. We are made so that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. So every day we are being like Christ. And the fancy theological word for that is sanctification. The goal of our sanctification is to become like Christ. We are becoming like Christ more and more each day. So that you are more like Christ tonight than you were last week. You will be more like Christ next week than you are tonight. That is our goal. No one is perfect and no one will be perfect in this lifetime. But our goal nevertheless is to become better and better and better. Becoming more and more like Christ. It's very important that we understand that. I've never met a successful person in any arena of life who has not committed to reaching goals. Let me repeat that. I've never met a successful person in any arena that has not committed to reaching goals. They are called winners. They're competitors. They know how to sacrifice their personal comfort to reach a goal outside themselves. They know what it means to sacrifice their personal desires and goals. They know how to sacrifice in order to attain a goal that is outside of themselves. If this is true of the world, how much more true is it for Christians and for Christians to be spiritually successful, knowing how to let go of personal desires, personal satisfaction, personal needs for meeting the need to be like Christ. That's what God the Father desires. That ought to be our desire as well. The reason why we worship on Sunday, 
the reason why we come to Salah on Wednesday, the reason why we wake up in the morning on Monday to go to work, the reason that we are so busy doing all kinds of things and yet still having that focus of wanting to be like Christ is that we want to please God. Bottom line, we want to be like Christ. Even from a human viewpoint, this is true. Again, to say nothing from a spiritual viewpoint, we must have this desire, this drive to pleasing God, sacrificing our own, ignoring our personal comforts. And that's what Paul says in verse 8. We studied this a couple of three weeks back. Verse 8 says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Some people don't like this word rubbish. They think it's rather dirty. So another translation. Actually, this is a very clean translation. Other translations has, as you know, manure. <laughs> Shall I continue? It's a lot worse than this translation. So rubbish to me is very good. I consider everything a loss in order that I may gain Christ. What are the necessary elements in doing this? What are the necessary elements in doing this? We looked at this last week. Some of you are not here because you are on mission trip to Hawaii. I want to remind us that in verse 17, Paul tells us to follow after examples. Follow after examples. Verse 17 reads, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In order to follow after Christ to mimic to copy, to imitate, to be conformed to Christ, Paul tells us three things, and the first one was last week, verse 17 again, to imitate, imitate me and people like me. So he says, us. I think he's being humble there. He, in order to say, follow my example, he just uses us there. Follow my example you have in us. That is number one. You have to follow examples of somebody. Christ is our supreme model. He's our supreme perfect example. Even though I want to be like him, he does not necessarily tell me how to get there because he's always perfect. I need somebody who has failed. I need somebody who has learned the ropes. I need somebody who has fallen, failed, who was fallen from the temptation. I need someone to tell me, I tried this way, but this way does not work. This way works. So Paul is saying, I am a follower of Christ, you be imitator of me and people like me. It is a very, very important thing. Number one, in order to accomplish becoming more and more like Christ, number one thing again is following after examples. Secondly, that's tonight, flee from enemies verse 18 flee from enemies for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ there are lots of enemies of the cross it says many it starts with for many there are many not some many to be avoided even in the church you have to be discerning. You need to be wise. You cannot accept anything that someone tells you. Even in the church, we have people who are camouflaged, people who come as false teachers. Jesus calls them wolves in sheep clothing. They look righteous on the outside, but on the inside, they are ferocious animals. They are wolves. You need to be careful. In high-profile media society like ours, bad examples get lost of exposure we see lots of bad examples in the media in the movies we get all kinds of examples that are not godly and yet they get the attention they are not going to come out and say we are against the cross we are against Christ we are denying salvation is by grace they will never come out and say these things but they are the enemies of the cross they are very subtle Members of the church often. They are members of the church. 
They are baptized. They are in the church. They are in fact in leadership. They are in the ministry. They are in the pulpits. You need to be careful. It, is, it just amazes me how children of God who are supposed to be learned students of the word of God, even after many years, just follow after many kinds of false teachings. They are very subtle. You need to be careful. Beware of those who come to you in sheep's clothing. In inwardly, they are wolves. Matthew 23, Jesus talks about false teachers. Matthew 24 talks about antichrists. In the book of Acts, Paul talks about people falsely claiming the name of God to cast out demons. Paul warns in his epistles to stay away from false teachers by knowing sound doctrine or teaching. In fact, the entire second Peter, Peter talks about unmasking false teachers. John is concerned with this in his three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And here Paul does it again. The New Testament is full of the idea that you need to be aware, beware of what is going on, be discerning. Again, absolutely amazed at Christians who will follow anything because they are undiscerning. And the way to combat these things, people in the church, is Acts chapter 20. Read this carefully. Acts 20, 31 and 32. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Did you catch that? I am crying, I am in pain, my heart is heavy with burden because you are falling to these people who are coming teaching false things and the way to combat that is by the word of his grace. You need to know his word. That is why we are teaching the word of God on Wednesday. That is why we're proclaiming the gospel on Sunday mornings. You need to know the word of God and I believe that the United States of America is going to fall under the teaching of false heretic teaching in this country soon. In fact, people are falling over already. I do not want you to be one of those. In the book of Romans, talks about having sorrow. Paul says, I have sorrow and continuous heaviness over Israel's loss. This is the first time that Paul actually is crying while he is speaking or writing. All the other times he said, I ha had sorrow. I was mourning for you because you're lost. But this is the only time Paul actually says here in the third chapter of Philippians, I am in tears. Paul was a very passionate man. Very loving, very gentle, very caring, passionate, aching over the lost. He wept both for the lost and the impact that these false teachers were causing. Who are the enemies of the cause? Let me, cross, let me give you two, two types of groups. For, first is false teachers, obviously. False teachers are the enemies of the cross. At the time of Paul, they were teaching false things and they're saying that you need to keep the law, you need to do these things, you need to do those things. They were false teachers. They were the enemies of the cross, not just Christ's death, but the whole of what Christ did. False teachers were saying the death and resurrection was not enough. You hear that all the time. It's got to be more. There's got to be more than just believing in his death and resurrection. To give you a small example, if you're raised in a Roman Catholic church or, or Roman Catholicism, they do not deny Christ. They do not even deny the deity of Jesus. They believe that Jesus is God, therefore there is salvation in him. They even believe in the resurrection. They don't deny any of that. Where is the problem is they say that is not sufficient. You must do certain works of spiritual deeds. In other words, you must earn your way in. Christ has done his part, but you must do your part, good works, good deeds to get into the kingdom of God. 
So the enemies of the cross do not necessarily deny the cross, but add to it. They accept the things of the cross, but they add something to it, and that is blasphemy. So they are the first group, first group of people, and the second groups of people are Gentiles. Look at verse 19. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and the glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. First, their ultimate destination is damnation. Their ultimate destination is damnation. The word stomach is appetite. And so it means dietary laws as part of the observance of the law necessary for salvation. Their appetite, they are talking about what is necessary for salvation. These Gentiles are enemies of the cross. At the time of Paul, there were groups called, a group called Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, Gnostics. They believe that spirit is good, body is, or all matter is bad. Therefore, since body is matter, body is evil or bad. Things pertaining to the spirit is good, but the body is evil. Therefore, whatever you do with your body is okay. Therefore, fornication, homosexuality, whatever you do with your body was all okay because this was evil to begin with. It does not make any difference. It doesn't matter. That's what they believed. Body is matter. What your body does doesn't matter. Since the body will be bad no matter what, gluttony, same gender, relation, fornication, all of these things were done at the time of Paul. And the contemporary liberalism says, I'm saved, but how I live does not matter. And you've seen that, and this is growing in this country. I am saved. I believe in Jesus. I am saved, but I can do whatever I want. However I live, it doesn't matter because my body is evil. It's going to hell anyway. My soul is what is important. The Jewish false teachers added to the gospel saying that you need more than what you believe. Liberals take away from the gospel. They take away the importance of living a holy life. Did you get that? So on the one hand, one group who are the enemies of the cross, they add to what Christ has already done, the work of the cross, meaning Christ has done everything. Without Christ, there is nothing. He is everything. They say, no, that's not enough. Another group says, you need to take some away from what you have. Both of those are enemies of the cross, and you need to watch out in the church. You need to be careful of these false teachings in the church. Whenever a pastor changes, whenever an administration changes leadership-wise in the church, whoever the present pastor is seems to do away or take away or add to what the previous leadership had, but you, the listeners, must be discerning you need to judge based on the word of God. That is why you need to be trained. You need to be taught. That is why you need to be careful and fight your sleep, fight the heat, fight the hunger, fight the schedule. And you need to learn because there come a time when there would not be any sound teaching. And once that happens, the only thing that, that you'll have is the word of God that you have. And by the Holy Spirit who, who resides in you, as you Memorize the scripture. As you meditate upon the message that you've heard, that's the only way that's going to keep you from falling into these things. You need to watch out. Verse 19 also says their God is their belly or their appetite. It's the midsection, stomach, sensual desires. Live by unrestrained sensual pleasures. That was happening all around in Paul's day, especially the first Corinthian. The Corinthian church was full of that. They were having sexual orgies in the hopes that they are actually honoring God. They're worshiping and they're allowing their sensuality to just overpower, control them. So they, it says here, their glory in their shame. The very thing they should shame them, they boasted. And that's like that it is today. Instead of being shameful, instead of being ashamed of our behavior, our action, we are bold. In fact, we parade our wrongdoing. We say, look at us. Look at what we're doing. So proud of 
all kinds of evil that we're doing. Their minds set on earthly things. Their minds are set on earthly things. Christians, by definition, are followers of Christ. Christ has ascended into heaven. We ought to be looking to Christ who is in heaven seated at the right hand of God. On the other hand, we are looking at the things of earth. Did I give you an example once before? Plants and trees have their roots in the ground. Animals look horizontally because that's how they are with their four limbs. Homo sapiens are the only ones built upright, meaning that we should be looking up to God, to heaven. But whereas everything else created in the world, praise God, men, women are the only beings that do not glorify God. And that is why God is going to return. Jesus is going to judge the world. And the world will have no choice but to bow down before him. And there will be no excuse. People will be without excuse. Minds set on earthly things. I want you to look at your lives tonight. As we spend a few moments in prayer, listen to the word of God and voice of God. Focusing on expectations will be next week, verses 20 and 21. The three ways that you can try to imitate after Christ to become more like him. First was following after examples. Secondly, fleeing from enemies. And next week we'll be focusing on expectations. Do not be fooled, brothers and sisters. Words are not everything. Actions must accompany words. But even though human beings are frail and cannot deliver what words say, you need to be captivated in the word of God so that you will not fall astray, that you will stay focused, that you will continue fighting the good fight. So whether there is a pastor or leader or any spiritual example, you will be equipped because the Holy Spirit is your resident teacher. He will guide you. You need to learn from the word of God and stay close to the doctrine. It is very important that you understand that salvation is by grace through faith, that it is by the cross of Jesus Christ that anyone is saved. You cannot add to it. You must not take away from it. It is all Christ. What you and I do in terms of our freedom equals zero. It is always 100% Christ. Christ is perfect. And so we need to follow people's example who have followed after Christ. Flee away. Flee from these evil enemies of the cross. And Paul means these false liberal teachers stay away from them and there are myriads of other enemies of the cross advertisement all kinds of things in the world i wish i had time if this was a retreat i could get into it but we will end tonight for you to pray tonight is an open prayer night rather than giving you prayer requests based on what you have heard I'm sure you have prayer requests on your own, personal. Maybe it has to do with your family. Maybe it has to do with your friend or maybe a very close friend. Maybe it has to do with your work, whatever. Whatever needs that you have, make your request known to God and he will be faithful. He will hear you and answer your request. So with the lights dimmed down at this time with uh, Brian playing for us, I want you to be praying for a few minutes with Caroline joining. I want you to pray just several minutes, as long as it would take, to pour out your heart. You don't have to be loud. God hears you. I want you to say your prayers to him right now. Thank you so much for allowing us to pour out our hearts to you. You already know what's in our hearts, but we said them anyway because we are stressed, we are burdened, we are uptight about many things. But we know that you are the answer. You're the only one who can resolve all of our needs. Father God, we know that we have sinned and come short of your glory. But through Jesus, we have been forgiven. 
And therefore, we are here boldly requesting all these things. We pray that you would bless our family, our loved ones, our sick ones, the ones who are in need of your help, our parents, our grandparents, our siblings. We pray for our friends, that you will protect them from all evil and harm. People could be walking in the street and terrible evil can happen at any minute. We realize how evil this world is. So help us to realize that we must cling to you even more. We pray for our church. This church that you have established 44 years ago, Cross Point Ministry, shorter than that, but your ministry that you have allowed us to have. Pray that those who have went back to their colleges and universities, you would bless them, that you would keep them safe, give them health, allow them to study focused and finish their tasks. Lord God, we also ask that you would bless all the merry people with their children. We were so, so glad to celebrate infant baptism and adult baptism last Sunday. We ask that you would bring about many, many more, much, much more fruit in the days to come. That where people are studying in Korea, people have left back to the East Coast and elsewhere, Northern California, due to work, pray that you will fill those empty, voided spots. Pray that you will bring about many souls to this, the ark of your salvation that you would bring many people to this house, that they would hear the unwatered down gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would be equipped in fighting off temptations and the enemies of the cross. We pray, thanking you ahead of time for what you are about to do. Some of us are looking for jobs. Some of us are looking for relationships. Some of us are looking to move. Some of us are looking for some kind of vision in our lives. Some people who are looking for some kind of zest, some kind of little spice in their life who are trying all kinds of things that can lead to addiction. I pray that they would find answers in you. May they come to the throne of God. May they come to your feet. May they lay down at your feet and receive answers from you. May they drink of your living fountain. May they eat of your bread. May they come to you, realize that there is eternal life only in you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have died for our sins. We pray that you would bless every one of us here and those who are not able to make it wherever they might be. Maybe they're sick, maybe they're traveling, maybe they have a meeting with their friends, maybe perhaps they're still working, maybe because of traffic, maybe because of distance, whatever the reason. Pray that you will keep them under your care. Put a hedge around them. Make sure that they return to your house of worship this coming Sunday. We were so thankful that many people helped out last Sunday's one meal activity, filling up those boxes. In hot weather, people gave their time, their effort. We appreciate their work and we appreciate you even more for allowing them to have a heart of wanting to serve you. We thank you for our praise team. We thank you for our media team. We thank you for all the servants of activity, welcoming, treasury. We are so thankful for the teams of photography, missions, inreach, outreach. We are so thankful, Lord God, that you have allowed us to have prayer warriors, all the members who are part of the committee, executive steering committee, we are so thankful that you have given us men and women who are passionate about you. We pray that you'll give us health, that we would not be ill, that we will be so strong, we would run but not get tired. Help us to fly to you so that we may please you, O oh God. I'm sure that you have heard our prayers because you are a loving God nothing escapes you there are no accidents thank you jesus for listening hearing our prayers we give you all the glory and praise and as we are about to sing our final song of praise be lifted up O oh god 
and lift us up as well. Those of us who are down, those of us who are a little bit lonely or depressed, encourage us, challenge us, pick us up, O oh God, and bless your servant as he delivers your word every single week. Use him as your instrument. May he be an example for others to follow. Receive praise and glory and honor from his life. We ask that you would bless everyone here. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise. I want you to make a commitment in making it out to the house of God both on Sunday and Wednesday, and especially the small groups where our facilitators doing so well and tremendous effort in leading us, guiding us, so that we might grow in the Lord. I want you to take the opportunities that you have on Sunday and Wednesday to grow in the Lord so that you may be able to flee from the enemies of the cross. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit grant you peace that passes all understanding now and for evermore. Amen.